Tales and welcome to Rautas 11th episode of uh, Norwegian Black Metal Crash Course, Chris Kush to the 1990s based black metal. Now, with this episode, the theme is more like those offshoots. That means the bands that really, really were not that much into black metal throughout their careers. Surely, they had their moments with black metal and really some memorable ones, but most of the albums, most of the material they wrote are not exactly black metal. So unlike some of the bands that were all the way through to the keeping course of black metal or some bands that went for death metal before or after, uh, these bands were just something different. The bands in question are Isengard, In the Woods and Manus. So let's start from the oldest of the bands here, meaning the one that got founded first. And it's of course a Dark Throne side project, Fenris side project known as Isengard. Now this is the only one that is from the 80s because most, as you probably know, most Norwegian black metal or black metal related bands were from the early 90s. But Isengard was there quite early on and this is of course explained because I mean Dark Throne was already there since like 1987 or so even though still in the death metal phase. Now Partially because of this, Isengard was basically never a purely a black metal band, but surely had its marks along the way of black metal. But because this is kind of a peculiar project, I think this kind of needs a little bit more explaining than just going through the couple of albums. Because technically speaking, there are only two albums by uh, Isengard. But it's worth noting that Vinder Skugge, uh, the compilation from 1994, uh, is something that people often refer as the first album. Yes, technically speaking, it's a compilation of old demo material and whatnot. But then again, that's what Isengard has always been more or less about. Creating different small demos and whatever, and then compile them into one. I guess Hustmörke is basically the only real album by the project. And I'm talking about the project because even though often we are talking about bands well this is only just one person band or well project and as such it's a little bit different than most of those Norwegian black metal bands we're talking about so like said um, if you take a look here it's like only known member of the band is Fenris from 1989 to 1995 surely their material released afterwards but really they are more or less older stuff and like I said, Dark Throne was founded before uh, Isengard, obviously. So this is kind of a peculiar. Why Fenris needed this kind of an outlet to do his Atur material? Because actually early, um, Isengard is very, very much just death metal demos. Like here, if you take a look at the Metal Archives genre definition here, it says death black early, full black metal later. This is partially true, but not the full scope of things. I mean, later on, it's more like heavy metal. And I don't know why this isn't even updated uh, with the latest release, but goes beyond me. I don't really care. I don't really know. But just saying this isn't the full truth. And you will understand if you personally go through the recordings. Now, for me, uh, Isengard came up into my radar, I think, late 90s. After Dark Throne, for sure. But I think without Dark Throne, it might have not been making the impact. Maybe it was roughly the same time. I, because I remember actually hearing Hustmörke very soon after it was released. Probably 1995 or possibly 1996. But I remember liking the folkier stuff, what was going on here. But this is something that we need to go through after Winterskugge. So this time I'm actually showing the track list here. Because Winterskugge is more than 60 minutes of music. And this is compiled of various demo recordings and as such uh, the whole music throughout the course of the release is quite different from one track to another. For example, the opening track, Winter Skugge, uh, Winter Forest or something, um, is a very very uh, good track, in my opinion one of the best by Isengard ever. And that is kind of a folk black metal kind of a thing. I mean, you have, can hear Fenris doing the clean vocals and all and doing totally different from Dark Throne. But then again, it's also totally different from the death metal stuff what Isengard or Dark Throne were doing earlier. But then it starts to change. There are parts where some of those uh, instrumental tracks are more like the kind of dungeons. And basically what the Burzum was doing uh, with their later recordings or some of the tracks 
which didn't feature vocals, that is instrumental also, but also something that uh, Fenris went to do with his other projects, you know, because he had his own ambient-like stuff, Neptune Towers. So Isengard seemed to be a little of a compilation, like a mixed bag of candies and goodies, where you have death metal, you have the folkier stuff, you have the dungeon synth kind of stuff, and then something else. For example, um, one of the best tracks, once again, uh, Storm of Evil, which is towards the end of the album here, at least, um, is actually a very, very groovy track, uh, featuring, or more like flirting with, kind of heavy metal, and then again, having this kind of a black metal vibe to it, but I mean, it's done with clean vocals and all that stuff. So whether you call it folk black or heavy black or heavy folk, whatever, I mean, it kind of a avoids those clear genre definitions. But then again, there are parts which is just more like flirting with death metal. And then there are parts which are just like, like in the, in the terms of progress, it's all a little bit like evolving. Very, very typical a demo phase thing. And as such, as this compilation shows, Fenris had a lot of idea. The execution might not have been the best out there for all the time. I mean, while I like what Fenris is singing, like I like his style, which is not exactly the best of the pile, but I mean, he has this kind of a strong voice and there's a certain kind of homage to whatever Bathory was doing with Hammerheart and Twilight of the Gods. I mean, we all know that Quartman wasn't the best uh, clean vocalist ever, but his passion was like shining through the whole stuff. And I think Fenris has really the same kind of a thing. And as such, Winterskuke is the kind of compilation you don't want to miss. Even if you don't really like all the tracks, I don't really favor all the tracks, but the best ones are really, really good. But I'm saying um, this kind of showcases how much talent, how much passion, how much interest uh, Fenrir has for various styles. Actually, it's kind of curious him having like a Hammer Rocks tattoo and being a fan of old rock, hard rock and all. Uh, it's kind of curious that it's not flirting with more, with just pure hard rock than that. This is a very, very much more folk, black, heavy metal leaning as well as with the Dungeons and parts, rather than, you know, going with hard rock and all that stuff, or classic heavy metal. So, it's an interesting compilation, and really, more than just an album. But then comes, then comes the best one, 1995. This may seem like a small gap of time, but you have to understand, compilation is like being compiled from various recordings years before that. So, it's not like these are as... Um, closely related in terms of time than what the timeline might suggest. Hussmerke is the real album by um, Isengard, and I think this, this is one of the peak moments of Norwegian black metal scene ever. Um, first of all, it features two black metal tracks which definitely um, challenge some of the best Dark Throne material ever. Really grim, raw, powerful stuff. It's like I don't know, Dark Throne and Gorgoroth having a child, a demon child, it's perfection, in my opinion. Hornboard, Chalice, and Total Death, just pure perfection. Um, but then again, the first five tracks, which are definitely something different, especially Nestle Box, strong kind of a folk metal track. And the whole album here is, in my opinion, fantastic, because it has the the feeling that you're really pushing boundaries, pushing the envelope, like the saying goes, with their folkier stuff, and then having a little bit black metal in the mix in the end. Kind of a weird, but also kind of a makes sense if you really think about this being a solo project. Now, of course, after this one, the band was goner, and whatever came afterwards is more like, you know, leftovers picked from here and there. And when this um, Vorian Dirn uh, came out, 2020, a lot of people said said to me, don't listen to it. It's horrible. It's not worth your time. And so because I didn't get the promo, I was like, okay, fine, I'll get back to it eventually. Uh, but I didn't have any uh, like passion to listen to it, even though as much as I like the early Isengard stuff, because so many people were saying like, it's very, very different. It's bad. Don't go for it. So I didn't. But for this project, obviously, the situation was different. Like, Jerry, you have to listen to it because it's part of the whole thing. And now I kind of regret it. Because this is like the worst of Fenris ever recorded. Uh, these are like bad heavy metal, doom metal songs, which don't really do justice, not to Fenris or his songwriting or his talents and all that stuff. 
this is like the worst he ever recorded. I, and I'm, I'm surprised this actually got put out. First of all, the songwriting is really lazy. It's kind of a, almost bad. Even it's mediocre at best. Uh, the vocals and riffs and everything is like, why on earth was this released? It's almost like shitting on a legacy, in my opinion. It's not super bad, but it's definitely more on the bad side of things than okay side of things. Uh, it's just something weird released that, in my opinion, should have been in the drawer, like the saying goes. And now, I hope none of this worst stuff by Isengard is never going to be released after this one. But if you want to, I don't know, tease yourself, go for it. And I don't know, even know if this Van Deren uh, from 2022 is here, but rated at 0%. Gotta be really, really awful. So I'm saying, if you have to listen to only one by Isengard, Hurstmörk is the stuff, but Winter's UK is really, really opening windows to many directions, and as such, definitely worth your time. The second band on this episode is In The Woods, which is more, I guess, easy, easier to explain, even though it has quite a few albums. Uh, the thing here is, this started more like a black metal band, but quite quickly after that, evolved into something different. And what is worth noting is that when you take a look at this lineup, you will have nowadays only one person, the drummer being the original ones and the later ones, something different. What is also noteworthy is that you take a look at this list here, especially the Botteri brothers, Christian and Christopher, they were the original ones and they did something different within the woods than what it was going on later on. So one could even make the statement, is In The Woods really the same band? Now, that is a different topic and probably we're not gonna touch that much. But the curious thing is, they were part of the band early on and joined later on and now they are gone again. I guess that should tell you a, quite an interesting story of the whole band. So, but to recap the whole discography with the full albums, I mean, I didn't go for the demos and singles, this would take way too much time and obviously whoever is into a certain band will find a way to dig deeper if necessary. But I don't know if that is necessary within the woods, depending on how you perceive it, of course. So what if it started with 1995 debut album Heart of the Ages, which is often misspelled with two capital letters in the first, like H-E, capital Heart of the Ages. Um, was kind of like atmospheric black metal back in the days and made waves because it was something different, soothing, atmospheric, in a way, pioneer records in that segment, featuring a lot of clean vocals, more clean vocals than raspy ones. And as such, in hindsight, it's easy to challenge and say, is it black metal really in the first place? Because nowadays, if someone would release such an album, people could be saying it's post black. Because I mean, it's not that black metallic when you think about the riffs, the vocals especially, or the whole execution. Surely it has black metal parts and definitely kind of a, goes under the umbrella of atmospheric black metal. It's like the Diet Coke version of black metal. It's the entry level stuff like, I really like the raspy vocals. I mean, being there done that. So you can listen to this kind of stuff. It's not violent, it's not super dark, it's not sinister, it's not cavernous, it's not caveman-like. It's like kind of a soothing, girlfriend black metal, if you will, in, in that sense. But it has those raspy vocal parts and as such, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, I get it, what do you mean? I mean, there's a reason why this album is so liked. But now in hindsight, doesn't do the justice. I mean, it doesn't have the impact on me anymore. I mean, it's kind of a decent album, but I kind of now remember well why I traded the CD away or sold it, who, who knows. I mean, it's decent 7 out of 10 for me, but nothing beyond that. Has moments and all that stuff, but then the band started to change, in my opinion, too much. Now, some people will say Omnio is the best one. Well, it's a different breed of an animal, so comparing... Um, Heart of the Ages to Omnia is like comparing to, I don't know, Kill Em All to Black Album or whatever you want to call debut Dark Throne album to the next one. Different animal, different breed, different genre. Omnia is always like, almost like a big step to the melodic progressive metal stuff. It's flirting with different styles. Black metal is pretty much goner by now and it's kind of a beautiful and soothing. But I find it, honestly, quite boring of an album. The thing here is, it doesn't do anything to me. It's more like, yeah, I get these guys are now doing more clean vocals. They are even better than the first one. They're adding some progressive layer and all that stuff. But it's not something that I fancy. It's not the kind of style that I get 
anything out of. So it's like, you know, in and out, and that's it. But I get it. For people who are in the soothing, beautiful music with some progressive elements, Omnia is a shit. And then comes Strange in Stereo 1999, which is the most boring album by In The Woods. Uh, it's almost like the band like decided to, hey, let's move on from the progressive melodic stuff. Let's start experimenting with Doom and combine that with the progressive stuff and whatever. And it's a kind of a drag, in my opinion. It's a very, very mediocre album because it feels like it's lasting forever and nothing interesting is really happening. As a Doom metal album, it's boring. As a progressive metal album, it's boring. As a melodic album, it's like, where are the good songs? Where are the good melodies? And all that stuff. It's not bad, but it's very, very forgettable, in my opinion. And now you will see this big gap. From 1999 to 2016, when the kind of a band made kind of a comeback. And this is explained here. The band was more or less on hiatus from 2000 to 2014. So this new era, or should we say third era of In The Woods is quite different. Now they're kind of going back to Heart of the Ages era, but in 2010's edition. Pure, Seize the Day and uh, Diversum are kind of carved from the same tree. And in my opinion, it shows the better version of the band, what it could have been. Surely it doesn't have that much to do with the early black metal flirtation, but there are raspy vocals here and there. For me, all these three albums in the end are the 7 out of 10 quality. They have quite nice ideas here and there, but it's not that memorable, not that catchy for me to like, hey, I want to buy them, I want to add them into my collection. So once again, they're kind of back to the heart of the ages era, but the 1990s feeling is missing, for better or worse. For better in the sense like the production is stronger, the songwriting is kind of like more solid, but at the same time, it's not the, having the nostalgic vibe, not the 1990s kind of a low budget, you know, recording feeling and all that stuff. But it's worth giving a shot if you like Heart of the Ages. Just don't expect it to be copycat material. In my opinion, all these three albums kind of justify the comeback of the band. Pretty nice, even if not that great in the end. Which leads us to the last band of the pile, Manas from 1993. Mind you, there are a couple of bands called Manas. The one that is explained here, one that evolved into Vedbu and Sende, and this one from Drondheim. And this is a curious band. Here you will see black metal early, experimental, slash electronic, slash jazz later. I would ask, add also trip hop or something. And now, mostly people know Manes from their debut album Under Ein Bladraun Mane, 1999. This was in a phase where a lot of Norwegian black metal had all abandoned their kind of roots. I'm talking about 1997-1998 as the transition phase where a lot of bands went to different direction. Some went for more electronic style, some started experimenting with other style, or just started making new wave of uh, black metal. And unfortunately for that, a lot of bands went to shite or in decline in so many ways. Not everything, but all. So Manus came right to what late to the party. Hey, here's Manus, 1999. I bring you an album that should have been out in like 1995. It's quite actually a good one. In my opinion, easily the best Manus album out there. But it's almost like a little bit late to the party. Like when everybody else had left the building, dude, something else than just traditional Norwegian black metal, Manus was like, hey, where am I supposed to go? I have this black metal here. This album still sounds like kind of a timeless. Kind of like, indeed, it could have been out 1994, 1996, somewhere there. But it was late there and then something else happened. Four years later, they came out with an album called Philosophe, Philosophy, if you will. And um, that is already something experimental. I wouldn't call it even avant garde black metal because there's very, very little anything related to black metal left in the band. It's almost like a fresh new start. The difference between Under and Philosophe is bigger than, you know, whatever Dark Throne had with Soulside Journey and A Blaze in the Northern Sky. At least, I mean, they were both metal from the extreme metal sense. These two don't have the thing in common. Philosophy is more like, let's go avant-garde directions, let's try to figure out what we're gonna do in the future. And as such, it's kind of a mess. It's not a horrible album, but in my opinion, quite a boring one. I remember it having boring when I heard it back in the days, and it felt as boring now. Like, kind of like a demo level transition stuff. Like, hey, we're gonna do something else. 
Now fast forward a few years and you will have albums like How the World Came to an End. Some people really seem to like it. 96% actually read the review because I was wondering why. Um, now, in my opinion, this is basically Manes doing full Ulver at this point. I mean, it has a lot of clean vocals, very little electric guitars anymore, kind of a trip hop elements, chassis parts, if you will, um, and then Cardi's jazz experimentations. So sometimes it's like uh, going full Ulver with a little Depeche Mode in the mix, but not having as good songs. Um, if you like later era Ulver, especially with the trip hoppy parts and the kind of a Brit pop stuff, then you are kind of like heading to right direction, more or less. And the same thing went on and on with the later album Be All, End All and Slow Motion Death Sequence. Um, I find these albums being listenable but forgettable. I, I mean, if I want pop music, I will go for the big ones that are actually catchy and memorable, but I'm not into pop. And even if you're a kind of a darker end of tree pop, no, sorry, but it doesn't do the trick for me. I mean, some people will like Ulver's like Flowers of Evil and that kind of stuff. And sure, by no means, then this might be your cup of tea. But I'm saying, if you skip all these compilation and smaller releases, which are way too many, and just stick to the main releases, anything under after Under and Blood and Mane is not metal. It's not black metal for sure. It's not metal in the first place. This is something else. So if you're looking for black metal stuff, the only thing you need for Mane is the full album maybe some demo material. And I think same goes for In The Woods. If you want some black metallic out of In The Woods, go with the first album. And then if you go back to Isengard, well, just two last tracks from Höstmörke, and that's all you need. So like I said, this episode is kind of weird because 90% of whatever these three bands made is not really black metal, it's different. It's folk metal, it's uh, melodic doom progressive stuff, and then some trip hop, whatever, jazz, event card, electronic music. So sometimes these are good reminders that not everything coming from Norway is actually church burning, arsenville, grim black metal, but quite something different. Yet these all are linked to black metal because once upon a time they indeed wrote some of that stuff. So wrote some of that memorable stuff. But this is, easy. this is a good example how it goes when people kind of grow up from their 90s, uh, teenage years in the 90s, and become something like more evolved, more woke, <laughs> in a sense, in their late 20s or 30s or whatever, and they start doing something else. Were these guys tourists to begin with, or was it just some growing up process? You get to decide. Well, Fenris, technically speaking, never left black metal, so Isengard gets that pass anyway. So, off you go. If you are interested to checking out these bands, now you know which albums to check out, which ones to avoid, or just go full in and listen to all the discographies and figure out for yourself. Thanks for your time. Next episode, we will touch more like symphonic black metal from the 90s. It's going to be something different than all these. So, keep your eyes and ears peeled, and see you soon with more episodes coming away. Bye-bye.